right. Hello, 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 everyone. Uh, I am Nika Sherell, and this is the ITCAST Real Talk on Sex. The ITCAST is our community outreach podcast that increases diversity in conversations on health and sexuality. Through this work, we are creating a world where all people feel loved, honored, and respected. We have some events coming up this season. Check out The Chase coming November 4th through 7th. Uh, the Chase is a wonderful, lovely uh, kink event that happens out in the woods. Go check it out. It's really lovely. You can learn more at thechase.pet. Uh, we also have the Global Sexual Health and Freedom Summit. That event has been postponed until February 4th and 5th, 2023. We do have the early bird tickets coming soon. So RSVP to find out more at sexhealthsummit.com. If you want to get one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, you can visit my link tree to book a free connection session. Uh, it'll be a great time for us to just sit down and get to know each other and see how I can serve you. Uh, we also want you to ask us anything. We want to hear from you. Please post your comments and your questions in the chat. If you have anything you want to ask in advance, you can also find the link to the form on the link tree as well. Uh, okay, definitely. This is the fun part, y'all. <laughs> You want to get access to our bonus content on Patreon. We do a little pre-chat, we do a little post-chat, and you just get to spend some time hanging out with me and the guest. Um, and there's a whole lot of other goodies on there too. So definitely check us out on our Patreon at Nika Sherelle. And then subscribe to this YouTube channel and share with your community. All right, we're going to dive in. This week's topic is Real Talk on the Erotic Arts. In the booth today, we have Redbone. Redbone is an internationally known, Minnesota-grown, and one of the biggest names in burlesque. She began traveling the world of the, traveling the world as one of the wham, bam, thank you, ma'ams, back up, uh, backing up the infamous Foxy Tan in her quest for world domination in 2005. Redbone has featured at Viva Las Vegas Rockabilly Weekend, is the 2019 reigning princess of burlesque of the Miss Exotic World Competition at the Burlesque Hall of Fame Weekender in Las Vegas in 2016 through 2022. Uh, made their Oh, sorry. <laughs> in Las Vegas during 2016 to 2022, they made their 21st burlesque, 21st century burlesque magazine top 50 most influential figures. All right, Redbone, join us on the show. Hi. <laughs> How you feeling? <laughs> oh, I'm feeling good. Happy Friday. Thank you. Happy Friday. Uh, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose to do the show. Um, well, um, so you said quite a bit. Um, um, yes, I am an international burlesque entertainer, um, as well as producer and MC. Uh, I also make a product called Glam Jam, which is an all natural glitter stick. Um, I, yes, have been a burlesque entertainer since 2005. Um, most recently I've been focusing on producing, um, and, um, I mean, I've produced quite a bit throughout the years. Um, Nudie Newbies um, being one of uh, the major productions um, starting in Minneapolis and then branching out to San Francisco. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, but most recently um, I produce uh, Moist, which is an all black erotic cabaret um, taking place at Oasis quarterly. Nice, nice. And other stuff, but I'll keep talking <laughs> if you don't stop me. So <laughs> love it, love it, love it. And we're definitely gonna dive into why those spaces are so important and you know what they mean inside of the realm of erotic arts. Um, so let's talk about what that term means. Like we got a gamut in that realm. So yeah, what it, what are we talking about when we say erotic arts? Um, well, I'm very much uh, a believer that like at the erotic at its simplest form is your spark of life. What is the thing that that makes you get up in the morning that like excites you every moment, right? Like when you feel that like, ooh, like that's the erotic. And um, and so, well, um, I do believe that it's co connected to um are like our sensuality and um, it, it expands into everything that we do, how we exist. Um, it's like, it's where we came from. 
and also where we need to continue to remind ourselves to be in and move forward. Um, kind of to something we were talking about earlier, but for that real like holistic uh, living. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I love that sort of like the eroticism. I mean, it starts with the sensuality and the connection to the self. So like mm -hmm. being inspired, I mean, being inspired to create, you know, whether it's um, whether you look at it as it, erotic isn't sexual. No, like <laughs> it, I think in essence, it, no, not real. Like, again, it's like, it is, it's, it's, it's that spark, it's birth. It's, it's that seed of, of, you know, inspiration, you know, for other, you know, other words to uh, assimilate with it. Um, you know, it's yeah. Juice, endorphin, like yeah. all the little like boops. Yeah. The, the passion, you know, the tinglies and stuff. Yeah. The tinglies. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good word <laughs> and and I love that you know like the that the tinglies may not always be like sexual tinglies but it is that like what is coming out of us um we so we talked a bit about um like sexuality well I'm like sexuality not being hidden but also I'm like still stuck on this not being a sexual thing <laughs> It, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, it's quite interesting. And, and I'll say, I mean, what I can speak to is my experience of like, refinding my, like the erotic within me, um, you know, post or pre pandemic, I was very um, like, not that I'm not goal oriented now, but very goal oriented, very task oriented, very like, um, like action without having intention or not being fully connected to myself and understanding what my uh, 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 actions are doing. Um, logically, I did, right? But was it coming from within, right? Like, was I feeling the intention? Um, and so in a way, um, performative, but not necessarily in a negative connotation, I don't think um it, everything i do did was very positive but all that to say is that i was try I, unintentionally trying to be all things to all people in terms of burlesque and production is mm -hmm. what i'll speak to specifically um and once uh the pandemic hit everything shut down it was like who am i and so very much was um based so much of my worth on my productivity and actions and um, and what I was putting out in the world in that sense and not necessarily artistically. Um, and so self, you know, all the questions of self of worth, what am I doing and why am I doing this? Um, and so all that to say, uh, you know, I very much had to get reconnected myself and had the time to do it. <laughs> uh, yep, <laughs> had the time to do it. Um, I was not, you know, as burlesque and pr performing arts, nightlife, everything as everything shut down. Um, um, while we did have the Zoom platform, um, it does not have the same connectivity as in-person interactions, right? Which that's just like, that's a whole other beast on its own. And um, anyway, so to find, refinding my erotic, getting reconnected with my body as dance has, is part of my erotic or how I understand myself. I consider dance as like my first language. And I think for most of us as humans, I mean, the, sure, we like make sounds and stuff, but we don't, we learn to speak and utilize words and stuff until later, right? But movement, our first communication is in the physical and whether it's like pointing or movement, um, you know, so dance, I, I think is everyone's first language. Um, I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, so I spent a lot of time um, in meditation, uh, uh, journaling, asking myself lots of questions, a ton of conversations with myself, um, reading, um, 
and actually it was that it was um you know like um bell hooks and um audra lord you know like those were two key authors that i really um based a lot of my healing in like right. it's like oh you know in in getting reconnected with myself and they you know they speak to the erotic quite a bit uh, like obviously maybe not obvious for some people I didn't I like I was one of the ignorant ones like wait who and then I was like uh right. go go look them <laughs> up like real real love bell hooks yeah um, so one of the things I'm hearing is that like before the pandemic like, or, or even just earlier in life, it was very logical, you know, like knowing um, the actions and what the, like what's happening both in your world and in whomever is experiencing you, but like the embodiment came later is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Or the understanding of the embodiment, because I think that, I mean, well, I was, I was passionate, like in this, I was passionate. I, I knew I wanted to dance. I knew I want to travel. And like, those are the things that came up from within, like I knew here, those are the things that I was going to do in life. Um, could I identify, and I, you know, would say passion, right? But, and also, well, that's really the erotic coming out and speaking and embodiment, which yes, so the understanding didn't come until later. Um, and and um, being okay with listening, listening to it and, or I had shut it off at one point. Like it wasn't about, because it drove me anymore it was mm -hmm. because career like so you're so yes the the logical aspects of success and like all these other things right <laughs> right no that's that's real and when I think about like you're talking about dance being one of our first languages dance is so embodied you know like you can do it from a logical place that's 100 percent. but when you're feeling it and allowing it to move you there's a completely different relationship so yeah, like, and that's, and that's the life force. That's the erotic. That's like spirit, you know, the spirit, that holistic mind, like, I mean, even forget mind for a second, you know, that body spirit connection, mm -hmm. you know, that manifests. And like, if you can just like not think about it until later, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Just let it take you. <laughs> let it take you. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Uh, and like, I have the experience that it's really hard to let go, to let go of that, like control aspect of I ha it has to look a certain way and I have to be perfect about it or whatever it is. It, it keeps us from just being in the in the flow of it and letting it carry you away. Um, so I think that's huge. And looking in that, looking at that, it's like that why we don't do it, how wrapped up that is in taboo, you know, and like, we're not supposed to do it. We're not supposed to feel this way or express things like this. Like it, it feels actually just very disconnected and shut down from who we are in our being. And a, I mean, so much of that is due to monetization, which is another difficulty of, I think a lot that we want to do as human beings. And then when when or I can I'll, again I'll speak to myself um understanding that like once you lean into monetization with it how do you hold on to the purity of of that force mm -hmm. which is like the difficult balance right keeping intentions intact and um not forgetting self and um the love and compassion and all while continuing to build community, you know, intentionally build community. And you're also talking about money a lot of the times in, in my career. <laughs> yeah. 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 Which also then comes to like attaching worth to money and all these other things. So it's, whew. <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear it. You know, it's it's that, you know, being like money being attached to it, worth being a, your worth being attached to value and money. And then also that being attached to sexuality and mm -hmm. where that leads. Um, yeah, you know, like the capitalist aspect. Um, I don't I don't certainly don't want to offend anybody out there, but first off, I'm a freak. Like just right. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. <laughs> and uh, 
when I started letting my freak flag fly, some mm-hmm. people were like, oh, well, why don't you get paid to do that? People get paid a lot of money to do that. You should do that. And for me, it was an exploration, you mm-hmm. know, more so than it was um, something that I wanted to do for hire. You know, it's like I respect people who are in that space. And I mean, like going hard, taking classes, learning how to be with people like there are people in that space who really know 100 percent what they're doing. And I'm just exploring who I am and, uh, and allowing some of my deeper and quote unquote darker places to show, but like allowing them to be and exist. And I think that that, you know, that gets separated when we look at like, you know, like these archetypes of who people are and what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. It, the ability to just enjoy it gets lost. Like, I want to take pole dancing classes. I probably will. <laughs> yeah, word. Right. And like for the for the experience of it, to be able to just feel it. Um, and I know that there's a lot in that space. So just looking at the disconnect between, um, you know, like the, the taboo, the taboo mm-hmm. and eroticism. Mm-hmm. It's, so uh, like quickly, so I have been involved um I've been a a club stripper. So I'm a burlesque entertainer. I've been a club stripper. I've been a phone sex operator. Um, I have only fans, um, right? So I'm in the field of sex work, um, considerably more like sex work adjacent and or on the like vanilla Tahitian vanilla end of sex work, if you were to categorize stuff, right? Um, sprinkles. some sprinkles, <laughs> well, sentiments, you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, I, um, not a full service sex worker, um, at this time and, and though have, right. So, um, have experience in, but it's not my full time. Um, so to that, like I've had experience in the monetization of, of the erotic and or selling sex, um, uh, and, or, uh, desire fantasy etc um yeah and now um similar to you um i while that exists um and or has exist, existed i also am in that space of um exploration for self and while sure i have thoughts of like oh i might want to be a pro dom in the future right like right <laughs> right like it's like, it's a thought and it like whispers out here, but the reality of like, but I need to know myself to the utmost Mm -hmm. to be able to do all that. And regardless, aside from that, like just how much, um, um, embracing the erotic and, uh, exploring kink and play, um, has allowed me to grow in a particular way. And, um, more understanding of humanity is a huge thing. Um, And right. It allows for a certain space to be like, I I don't know. It's a certain amount of compassion. It's like learning about compassion and compersion and um, Mm. all these things about like, like, um, just seeing pure joy in other people and being able to um, hold space for that for others. Yeah. Um, and how much that brings me joy. Like, oh, this is why I actually, it's not about the money. This is, this is actually why I do it. Right. You know? Right. So like, the money is a, it's a symptom. It's a good symptom. And, you know, like allow it to be, but you're right. It's like that, you know, to be able to, how can I serve someone and how can I serve them powerfully? Um, I want us to rewind just a second. Sure. Uh, can you define compersion for our listeners? Mm. Right. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. <laughs> um, well, from my understanding, because I'm fairly, uh, you know, new to this term as well, but um, is it brings me joy to see other people um, experience joy. And, um, if it was in a sexual, uh, situation, like my partner, um, uh, seeing him go on a date 
And like the joy that it brings him to be with this other individual brings me joy because I'm like, oh my gosh, look how happy he is. You know, look and like, and that brings me joy, right? So um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. How'd I do? <laughs> no, that was great. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, <laughs> and you know, what I love about it is like plain and simple, it, it's the antithesis of jealousy you know, to not be jealous or envious of your partner or, you know, anybody else. Like for me, I also hear it as like, don't be a hater. Like if we just want to take it all the way down, like I, it's easy to see someone else doing well. And I'll speak for myself. I'm like, I see somebody doing well and I'm like, I ain't doing like, like why they got to be having success or whatever it is. And I'm like, oh, I'm judging them and not looking at me. And really I'm judging the things in them that I don't want to acknowledge over here. So that, yes, that part. And I think that's the the biggest question that I'm learning about jealousy. Like that's the first thing. Wait, why am I jealous? Oh, it literally has nothing to do with them. That has to do with me and where I'm at in my life. Right. And so us unlearning jealousy. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that is a a top behavior due to scarcity mindset, due to um, haves and have nots, the comparative. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the the one of my favorite sayings is uh, to compare is to despair. Right. If we start looking at other folks and being like, oh, why don't I look like that? Or why don't I diss that? You know, right. Like that is going to create a disparity within ourselves that doesn't need to exist. Right. So it's like just let's not do that. Um, I noticed Betty had a question, right? Um, I don't believe, um, so does it always need to be a third party? I don't, wait, was that specifically party person? Oh, person. Person. Um, No, I don't think it necessarily, I do think that it is, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a person. Like, for example, again, like I'm going to go to my partner, like my partner has a podcast as well, right? Um, Deaf Perspective, FY, shout out. Um, Go for it. (laughs) (laughs) And so it's like, it brings me joy to hear him talk about the story that he was researching or the conversation that he had with uh, so-and-so. So So, um, I'll say that, that I don't necessarily think it needs to be sensual or sexual. I think it's whatever sparks joy in another person but I that also could be like their own workout they had a really great workout and it's like oh I love hearing you talk about how much whatever brought you joy yeah I I think I don't know what do you think no I think that I think that's perfect spot on like it can be very easy to be jealous of you know like I I, I think that it, it correlates to partner here, you know, whether it's one or multiple partners, but the idea of like, I'm, I'm perhaps jealous of your new job, or, you know, I'm perhaps jealous of the time that you're spending, you know, getting enrichment, like you said, like whether it's taking a class or, um, you know, like having a bubble bath to yourself, if I don't feel like I can be a part of that and that upsets me, then I think that's exactly what you're talking about. It's like, I can't see you being happy. It's a psychological thing. It's an underneath thing, but you know, it, it's real. And I think this is great because it circles, it encompasses the conversation around the erotic arts. Like, what do you do if you feel a certain way about your lover going to the strip club or being at a burlesque show or, you know, anything, any other form of- Join them. <laughs> <laughs> Be a part of it. <laughs> that's, that's what made my answer to it is just join in on the experience <laughs> yes yes but, mm-hmm. um I just told two stories last night about my favorite times at strip clubs um that was wonderful for the record be the woman in the strip club you'll get a lot of extra attention go for it <laughs> you'll have the most fun mm-hmm. so yeah and it's you know, to be able to see your partner having that kind of fun is just, I think it's really beautiful because it can become a fun thing that's done together, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, also, like, I mean, and there's the communication around it too. 
Oh, sorry. I'm like looking at the chat. Yeah, no, no worries. We got a comment in here. Uh, hey, bro. And um, you were talking about comparisons. And one of the things I love about burlesque is the acceptance of all body types. I could see myself there. Absolutely. Burlesque. And, and it's that um, burlesque is for everybody, you know, everybody. So um, and it's it's. So, oh my gosh, I'm like, where to, where to start about burlesque? Okay, so um, I live life in the lens of burlesque. So I really am like, everything is burlesque. Um, but um, <laughs> absolutely. Um, and it's so interesting to watch it evolve in so many ways. Like for those that don't know, like we wouldn't have current day strip clubs if it wasn't for burlesque. Um you know, we're, we're cousins. It's very much rooted, like quick history. Um, there is, it was, uh, the burlesque show. And in the broad term of, of burlesque, it was essentially like vaudeville variety show. Right. Yeah. Um, then, um, with the dancing girls. So the burlesque dancers were then just called like the dancing girls. And there was chorus line. Then there was the headliner that mm -hmm. was the dancing girl. Right. Um, uh, well, as economics, happened they started taking certain elements away from said burlesque shows and it became just the dancing girls then the dancing girls um you know again economics it wasn't like well we can't do the large costumes or whatever right so then costumes got slimmed down um so then it was less and less then it made again i think there was the realization of like oh sex sells right like that sort of mm -hmm. happened so then mm. it became more about the nudity and um less about like the artistic components of the striptease um mm. and so more about the nudity more um purely like fe the female form but then also then evolved into sex shows uh and so on mm. um then of course there was like a huge dip in stuff um and while burlesque uh, in its like classic form still existed, it was far, far you know, far, far in between. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the the OG burlesque dancers did their, you know, with the times, they're like, okay, they became strippers, right? So then the, the evolution of becoming strippers came in. Um, fast forward, um, in the uh, early, late, late 90s, mid to late 90s, like burlesque never went away, but there was definitely a resurgence um, uh, in the 90s. So then that became our neo burlesque wave, uh, new burlesque, where a lot of those folks uh, were in performance art and or were um, really uh, looking to the heyday of burlesque. And so those classic elements uh, started to come back, whether that was boas, feathers, uh, um, or feather fans, uh, excuse me, gloves, uh, things like that, panel skirts, um, which um, there was a particular era in the strip club that became uh, kind of popped up in that same time with the feature dancer. Okay. Right. So the feature dancer um, came back to the strip club um, it was both either porn star that would come and feature at the strip club or a strip club, a strip club dancer that um, was using classic burlesque elements. And so then therefore they were a featured dancer at the strip mm -hmm. club. Um, but then, um, I mean, and that's more like in the industry, in the kind of community component of stuff, there was a lot of performance artists that were using these class classical burlesque elements um in their art and or uh uh yeah I guess that's about it <laughs> so <No>. then <laughs> not that's about it right but then um but then it's that um then there were more pops who started to see it like kind of all over the country um that neo the neo movement um in terms of noticing it was definitely like LA San Francisco New York Mm -hmm. um Minneapolis there was a pocket in Canada um and then uh, like of course New Orleans uh, where it never really went away there right. right but kind of um 
and and so um oh and then seattle right so like generationally then they all started to come together are finding each other on like yahoo groups <laughs> and aol messenger and like all that stuff right so Ooh, you dateless, dateless. I know, dateless. <laughs> They, they found each other through, you know, whatever kind of chat things, you know, that we had in the 90s. Ooh, Black Planet. <laughs> you know, oh my God. Oh my gosh. Wow. Um, yeah. And that's to say, and actually I'm glad you said Black Planet because I think that they're, what is interesting today is um, specifically the, um, kind of the history of Black burlesque being left out of um, a lot of the conversations in the earlier days. Well, um, there were several Black burlesque entertainers, um, OG OGs like 1920s things and moving forward, um, 1800s even, all that, and, and even into today, um, um, we're still learning so much about our Black burlesque history. Um. Uh, yeah, and I'll stop there because then I feel like that's gonna <laughs> shift into a whole nother thing. So I don't know if yeah. Um. Yeah. So Daniel asks, um, are there more steps to getting rid of jealousy? Mm. More se- more steps to getting jealous. I mean, it's okay. I'm not. I'm not a professional here. But, but what I can say for myself, <laughs> how I can speak to is I, I personally, it's like the first step is asking myself, why am I jealous? Right. And really die, um, parsing through and, and, and looking at all, all those parts of like, okay, ask and having conversations with myself. This is a lot of my journaling processing of like, why do I feel this way? Right. And so I think a big thing, like, so instead of initially I, I have a rule where I take 48 hours to process something. Um, and generally it's like, specifically if it was jealousy, it's like, okay, that 48 hours to get through of, okay, why? Why did it hit me in a particular way? Oh, okay, is it because like, for example, this is something me and my partner went through. Um, um, he went on a date and I was really excited about his date. And then he went on the date and he Marco Poloed me and was like, oh my gosh, it was so fun. And I could see like the light in his eye and like, and I was like, oh, he was really excited about this date. Right. And then I was like, that's great, honey. Um, I'm going to take some time to process my feels and I'll talk to you later. Right. Yep. And I, so I take, took a look at it and it's like, I realized in myself fear of loss, right? Which, okay, then I had to really ask myself, am I really afraid of losing this situation? And, or can I come to a logical point of like, um, okay, if I did lose this uh, uh, relationship, you know, what's the silver lining around it, right? Like, and really like coming to a particular piece within self of like, well, I don't know the future. And I don't know what any situation is going to be, but can I have enough faith um, in myself and, or the experience that I've gotten what I was supposed to receive out of said situation, right? Like this is the lesson the universe wanted me to learn. Like, okay, cool. Um, You know, what is the other thing? I'm like, I was comparing. Oh, Mm -hmm. she a cute little light skinned black girl too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? oh wait, wait 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 that's fine she is really great and like and so then started to be like she is really cute and oh I would date her and like come into this space of like um okay what if he wasn't even involved how would I feel about her you know and so I guess a little mix of like fan fantasizing I don't know but again just kind of cream creating some peace around that relationship and or possibility of her and I having a relationship. Right. Um, And then being able to come back to the, to him and have the conversation, like I was having some feels, but I'm really happy you had such a good day. And I look forward to hearing more. Keep me posted, you know? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I also have heard this of like um, some other uh, tips are like to like feeling secure in said relationship in regards to the jealousy of like going back and reminding yourself of times that you guys had together, right? Like um, looking at pictures or reminiscing on certain experiences um, as well as um, assisting the partner get ready for said date. Um, yeah. So then you kind of feel a part of it. If that's something that like it was, is in that agreement. Yeah. You know, which is, that's the whole other thing is like, what are the agreements? What are the conversations that are being had in said relationship? Yeah. Yeah. That one's huge. You know, I know a lot of people where, you know, the communication is different. There are people who want to know all the everything, all the details. And there are people who are like, I know what's happening. I don't want to hear about it. Like this, this is us. And, you know, like I'm happy for you. And also I don't need details. Um, and so like, you know, everyone is different. And, you know, what I've experienced is there's a commitment to not being jealous. Cause like mm -hmm. it comes up several times over, you know, it's a part of, it's part of the natural way in which we were taught, you know, culturally. Um, and you know, there are, there are shifts happening, but really it's a practice of committing to not be that. And then also letting go of attachments, you know, like you were saying with, um, you know, like being attached to any particular outcome, uh, that's, that's the easiest way to experience disappointment. And also that possessiveness over someone in my experience can very much push them away. You know, mm -hmm. like, like we, we think that love is a lot of, like, sometimes we think that love is jealousy and possessiveness. That's how oh. it acted out. Yep. <laughs> I'm so happy I'm 40. That's what I can say. I'm like, I'm so happy I'm 40 and that I don't <laughs> believe that anymore. Like I, that I have a greater understanding. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. But like, but that's, the, but that's, that's your own. Yep. So that's that, how we that's learned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was something you said that um, I quickly, there's a, a, a term that has really assisted me of, um, wait, I'm gonna come back to it because I have to look it up. So there's two things is that there's this workbook. Wait, say something. I'm gonna go get this workbook really quick. <laughs> I want to show you. It's a jealousy workbook that, oh, I love um, that my homie brick house was suggested. Cause I was like, I'm nervous that I'm going to get jealous. And so I was like preparing myself. I haven't used the workbook yet, but I have it. If something extreme happens. So I'm going to go grab that. Yes. Tools. Okay. I love this tools. tools. Um, and I, I just wanted to double back to a comment that red bone made a few minutes ago about, you know, like you, yeah, she's a cute light skinned girl and the other girl's a cute light skinned girl. And I was like, Oh, look at that where you have to have that level of self-acceptance, you know, seeing the similarities and not getting hung up on, you know, what's, what could make you envious of them that you have in yourself. So mm -hmm. And like the beauty of it, like the beauty you have in yourself, not the garbage or whatnot. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so. The Jealousy Workbook. Exercises and insights for managing open relationships. Let me get it. There we go. Catherine Labriola. All right, we're going to get some information about that in the chat so that y'all can understand and have resources so that you can grow in how you, how you sex. There we go. That's a good word. Yes. Um, and I'm trying to, I was like, where was that term I wanted to say? Uh, uh -huh. It's like letting go of the Mm, I like added it to my, I'm sorry, this is taking so long. I don't mean to eat up, eat up time, but it's something that is like, where is it? No, it's, um, I'm mad. I'm mad. I can't find it quickly right now. <laughs> I like wrote it. 
Please go ahead, continue. <laughs> no worries, no worries. If we don't get it on the show, we'll get it in the after chat and we'll make sure to get the resource and uh, the quote, if we can, into the chat so that everyone watching can be with it and you know really get what they need. Um, Detach from the agony of involvement. And I, I feel like that could be seen in so many ways, but like, so I, personally, I'm like, Detach from the agony. So, because you were talking about like attachment, mm -hmm. right? And so oftentimes we have, I think that we have attachment to the agony, right? To the like, mm -hmm. ugh, oh, ugh, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can separate and detach yourself from that agony, that involvement can sometimes bring us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, detach from the, the agony of involvement. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, it reminds me, I'm taking these acting classes and they're all like very emotionally based. So there are these things that come up for us and the teachers like, uh, well, one of the things that happened, I had this moment come up and the teacher was like, oh, you like judging yourself. And I was like, huh? No. And he was like, just sit with that for a minute, you know, see if anything in there is real. And I was like, ah. <gasps> Oh my God. <laughs> like it was so deeply real. Like I spend so much time in that space and it, it's a, it's a way to deflect the love that's available. And so when I stop judging myself for those things and I start loving myself for those things, the agony is gone, but that new space is quite uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's like getting comfortable with the uncomfortability. Yep. Right. Yeah. I ain't gonna say compersions. It's, it's like that in the beginning, given the, the context that I was raised in. It's very much like, okay, I have to get comfortable with being comfortable enough in myself to know that whoever I'm with loves me for who I am. And that's not going to change no matter how they feel about somebody else and who they are. Right. So. And we have to love ourselves enough. That's, I think, is so huge about like getting into open relationships or, or living particular lifestyles. Like, I feel like, again, I'm like a lifestyle newbie. So both the things that I'm learning, it's like I, if I hadn't have done a lot of the work and or, you know, and continue to do certain work in terms of like holding myself in particular ways, there's no way I'd be able to do this, right? Like it would, it, it hurt people, hurt people, you know what I mean? And so, you know, healing stuff around that so that um, I can't, you know, in, in living my authentic self and acceptance and self in so many ways um, and making peace and continuing to explore that stuff. So as to have growth and in, enrich our lives in expansion. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think we tackled that one pretty good. Tag team. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Look at we were there. I was like, look, we therapizing now. Hey. <laughs> okay, so I want to circle back to one of them spots. She was like, ooh, that's a big one. Black people being left out of the conversation with burlesque or being po uh, portrayed in a particular way. You know, like there's a the whole gamut of ways in which black people have been represented over the years and ways in which we've been left out. So I think this is a great space to talk about that and to hear about some of your events and the spaces you're creating. Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Like, so yes, I think that we have been left out of particular conversations and in the same time we've been busy doing the thing so maybe not even having time for the conversation right but it's unfortunate when we're when that isn't seen right right and so and I think that's um you know obvious I don't see for all black people but I I feel like that is a thing we're too busy doing the thing to talk about the thing <laughs> that's fair what is it uh, <laughs> Be yeah, about it, don't talk about it. Is that yeah, be about it, don't talk about it. And so I've always very much been like, you know, I speak through action. Right. Like, so um all that to say is that like the, the Black Burlesque community um nationwide has um been prominent, but maybe not necessarily seen as much um due to 
uh, other people not talking a bit about it and or ourselves, which I do think we're coming into a space again that it is be becoming more um, prevalent and, and people are becoming more aware. Um, and other folks are, no, I'm not gonna talk about other folks. Anyways, um, uh, so uh, I started with Fox Etienne, um, who is another uh, black burlesque entertainer. Um, and even prior to us, um, there was Harlem Shake burlesque um, based out of uh, the Bay Area um, and uh, uh, a lot of bouté and Teresa. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know a lot of bouté, right? A lot of bouté. <laughs> like, also, you know, play scene, leather scene, kink scene, mm -hmm. OG. Um, and uh, Teresa, who, and I'm, I feel like such an asshole right now because um, I'm excited about talking about it that I'm not. Simone de la Ghetto. Okay. okay. Simone de la Ghetto is her burlesque is her burlesque name. And um she, along with another individual, was the one who started Harlem Shake Burlesque. And so they um there was also um Brown Girls Burlesque happening in New York. And I think they kind of started around the same time. Um, and that was just a few years before Foxy Tan and the Wham Bam Thank You Ma'ams happening in Minneapolis. Then a for few short years, there was also Coco Dupree, who was around for a long time, but she was pretty much the lone Black individual in a all-white troupe. Yeah. yeah. And there was a lot of, then in uh, Canada, we had Coco Frambois. Anyway, some quick neo uh, burlesque. Um, fast forward. Um there is a uh, Pearl Noir and a particular individual uh, oh, and Pearl Noir who now um, has uh, the Noir Festival, a POC festival, um, and has done a lot within the um, Black and POC burlesque community. Um, but Jeez Louise is an individual that I um, really was drawn to. Um, I had taken a hiatus from burlesque and came back and I was like, wait a minute, who's this? And similarly, I was like, wow, like we're real similar in terms of performance and like whatever. And so I was just really drawn to her and and in ways that like she was doing a lot of research within um, Black Burlesque. She started a show called Jeezy's Juke Joint uh, nice. in, in Chicago. Yeah. And it's been going on for like 12 years now. Um, and so then there's a core cast in Chicago, but then also travels. And so I've she has become a wham bam thank you ma'am so there's foxy tan and the wham bam thank you ma'am so she is like our third now and uh as well as uh she has juke joint which um i'm a core a core member but like traveling core member because i'm not based in chicago obviously like um so um all that to say um as it, she's somebody who was like a peer and also i looked up to um and there has been several Black burlesque shows um, happening. Um, so I will now fast forward and speak to mine. <laughs> um, and I want to make sure we can get as many of those into the chat or in the comments as possible so that everyone knows how to connect. I think there's also, when I say outside of the conversation, it's like people just don't know. You know, like it's a world that, you know, isn't necessarily the mainstream side of it isn't necessarily in representation of people of color, Black people specifically. And so like being able to have people know and understand this world and go and just be entertained, just be entertained. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a really big step in that direction. So getting to connect these dots is huge and continue. Yeah. Um, oh, I'm also what the funk festival is a another uh, POC festival out there, but black um, shows specifically um, in Seattle, Brick House um, has one. Um, there used to be Chocolate City Burlesque um, out of DC. Um, anyways, there's a wonderful resource called the Brown Pages. Um, po Chop is an individual out of Chicago who started uh, on her on their website, uh, The Brown Pages, which is a resource for all black and brown uh, burlesque entertainers in the country, as well as uh, the US, I mean, the Canada and I think some of Europe. 
Um, so if you're a Black burlesque entertainer out there and you're not on this resource list, definitely go and fill out your um, information. Um, I highly, and if you're a producer and looking for Black burlesque uh, entertainment, uh, use this resource. Nice. There, is no, there is no excuses anymore. There's literally like no excuses anymore. Um, so People can go to um, Cyclone Enterprises, which is my production website. Um, when you go there, you have the option of going into me as the artist and then my production um, page and sign up for the email list and um, you'll get notifications of shows that I produce. Um, prior to the pandemic, like right before shutdown, I did an event called Black Ass Weekend where we um, highlighted and promoted um, Black burlesque entertainment here in the Bay Area. Um, uh, and we had Jeezy's Tube Joint core cast as our, our guest artists. Um, and so we did a whole weekend. It was five shows um, plus workshops and after parties. Um, and it was, what was that? Thursday through Monday. Um, and so I'm hoping to do that again uh, coming up here in 2023 probably. Um, but currently I produce a show called Moist, which is an all black erotic cabaret at Oasis. Um, that happens quarterly. Uh, and the um, other event that I have just started um, is called Strip Club Q. It's uh, an all queer uh, strip club pop-up. Uh, so yeah. Love get on the email Love list <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm trying to do what I'm trying to my I'm like in like goals in life I would love to be able to pair it that whole weekend like strip club Q moist and pair it with when there's an express yourself which is the POC play party that Jet Noir and others uh curate so I would love to you know have a whole yummy weekend of yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> you no, know? I'm like, let's stack these events. It'll be yes. Cute. Yes. Have a whole weekend I, of stuff. I'm going to do what I can to have my black ass at that black ass weekend. So, yes. yes. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. So, is there any other? Uh, oh, and it's the brown pages, right? Uh, yes. Brown pages. Okay. Cool. I was like, let me see if I can grab the link. For you. No worries. No worries. I think Betty might be able to handle that. But um, oh, is okay. there, yeah. Is there anything else that you want to share about your work? Actually, what is the, what's the, and I'm so sorry, I actually have this one before we wrap up. How does your work impact the world? That's what I want to know. And then anything else that you want to share before we complete? Ooh, how does my work impact the world? Well, um, I believe that anybody that partakes in it, um, it will um, shift perspective or highlight perspective, um, assist in embracing um, one's own uh, desires and sensuality, um, which inherently shifts their, them at a mo molecular level which improves their life. So they will move forward into the world a much, um, a much more enlightened individual, mm. which only like, it's a contagious, a contagious thing. You know, your joy is, um, you know, it, it, it becomes infectious. I believe, I believe. Yeah. In, in the positive sense. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, yeah. that's real. That's real. Like I'm infected right now, just in case y'all can't see. <laughs> Yay, joy. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And you know, the thing that I really appreciate is that you are creating these spaces for people who, um, you know, like who would enjoy to, uh, would enjoy a safe space in, uh, in which to go. So like I've been to so many strip clubs uh, an innumerable amount of strip clubs, I couldn't tell you. Um, and I've never been in a queer, erotic, safe space where like the people were, 
unique, you know, like I just, I have this experience that in that space, it's not like I'm going to see the same template of the same body. Like it, it can be anybody, you know, bringing who they are and representing who they are. And I think that's beautiful. You know, I think that there's a lot of rigidity in the way that we've approached sexuality. And this is just a way to open it up and love and explore and create. Yes. Yes. Ah, all right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I love having you here. Yes. And uh, everybody out there watching, thank you for uh, tuning into the show. Stick around, or sorry, go to our Patreon to check out the after chat, which we are headed into right after this. Um, and uh, just to, you know, just to go back to the beginning. <laughs> Uh, the ITCAST is our community outreach podcast that increases diversity in conversations on health and sexuality. Through this work, we are creating a world where all people feel loved, honored, and respected. Uh, definitely check out our events coming up this season. We talked about the lifestyle. We talked about kink, so I'm just going to be straight. The Chase at thechase.pet is a lovely kink event where we're going to go out into the woods and dress like animals and play hide and seek. It's the best fucking thing ever. Just wanted to be straight with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorites uh, and there's a hot tub okay so <laughs> the global sexual health and freedom summit has been postponed until february 4th and 5th 2023 uh we are going to have early birds take early bird tickets coming soon you can rsvp at sexhealthsummit.com and just a tidbit of additional information that is a global virtual summit where we're bringing together 14 international speakers to have a conversation on health sexuality empowerment and awareness so please join us for that. Um, if you want to get one-on-one -on -one coaching with me, you can book a free connection section, go through my link tree to the Calendly. We want to hear from you. Thank you for your question today. Thank you for your input, your comments. This has been wonderful. If you want to submit anything before our next show, go to the link tree and feel free to ask us anything. Um, all right, let's see. Again, check out our Patreon, learn more at theitcast.com, subscribe to this YouTube channel, and share with your community. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next week. Thank you.